I just want to welcome everyone again on behalf of the SUNY Delhi Alumni Association and the college. And I would like to thank Victor very much um, for doing today's session for us. Um, he's done a, a number of wine tastings for our alumni gatherings in the past, as well as um, for the campus community. They're always very highly anticipated. He's got great knowledge to share with us this afternoon. And I'm gonna turn my camera off and let you take it away, Victor. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. It's it's good to uh, it's good to be here today. And, um, today we're going to discuss a, a wine region in, in uh, central France called uh, Beaujolais. Um, now, I'm assuming everyone has heard of Beaujolais before. Does anyone here have you drinking or or had the chance to enjoy? Uh, Beaujolais wine. Anybody? No. I have. I've had Beaujolais Nouveau. It's pretty tasty. Okay, great. Oh, what's going on, Mark? Hey, chef. So Beaujolais, Beaujolais is a is a, a wine region that that much often people associate with Beaujolais Nouveau. Now, Beaujolais, Beaujolais Nouveau makes up for a huge amount of the production of the Beaujolais area. Um, I believe from the, from the, uh, how do I put this the best way? It makes up 25% of the total production of the Beaujolais area, but it makes up 50% of the production of the Beaujolais and Beaujolais Village uh, areas. And we'll talk a little bit um, about the differences between all those in, in a little bit. Um, was anyone able to uh, buy any of the suggested wines that I had? I got I got two of them here, the La Pierre Morgan, uh, uh, Louis Jadot, uh, Beaujolais Village, which you can find this wine in basically if any wine store. I have a, a wine that I didn't suggest, but I but I found it. it's a uh, Georges uh, Decon's uh, Beaujolais Blanc, which actually Beaujolais Blanc only makes up, or white Beaujolais only makes up about two percent of the reduction of the entire Beaujolais uh, region. And as you can see in the background, uh, it is actually a pretty uh, stunning region. So um, a little. A little bit about Beaujolais. Let me actually put this into a slideshow. A little bit about Beaujolais. It's in, the, it's in Eastern France, sort of in the central part as far as the, the latitude is concerned. And it borders, it borders two regions uh, or two wine regions, let's say. Um, Burgundy, which actually Beaujolais is technically sort of considered part of Burgundy but the majority of it lies within the Rhone department or the, the Rhone department is in within the, uh, the Rhone Alps uh, region. So um, it's most, the majority of it is actually considered to be part of the Rhone, although the wines themselves are not considered to be uh, Rhone Valley wines. Um, and as you can see on the map here, again, there's, Beaujolais right here, it's really close to the uh, to the city of Lyon. And if you go to Lyon, France, the the um, the wine that is sort of the everyday wine there happens to be Beaujolais. But if you go into uh, um, north to Burgundy, that is probably definitely not the case. Um, and Beaujolais kind of. Uh, its its reputation sort of suffered over the years, and in part and part of that is due to the popularity of Beaujolais Nouveau, which Beaujolais Nouveau can be uh, can be good, but it had it, it hasn't gone without its uh, um, its controversy throughout the years, let's say, or scandals um, through overproduction and overchapitalization, which is adding sugar to to the uh, fermenting juice 
to get the alcohol higher. Um, so unfortunately, Beaujolais um, has, in particularly in the 1980s, had to kind of um, crawl out of its uh, um, little, little uh, slump that it was in. Okay, so again, right between Burgundy and the Rhone Valley, which Burgundy is probably one of the only wine regions in the world. And I would say pound for pound, the most expensive wine region in the world. And then you go to Beaujolais, which again is technically part of Burgundy. This is a place where you can find really good wines for a, uh, a really great value compared to the, the Burgundy to the north. Um, and we talk about Beaujolais, we're talking about wines from the, you know, you can buy really great wines from the, I'd say 12 to $40 price point. But then the highest you're really going to get in Beaujolais is maybe that 70 and $80 price point. Um, so if you, if you like really good wine and you don't like to pay a lot of money for it, which I think is the case for all of us, then, uh, then Beaujolais is a really good place to buy wine from or wines from Beaujolais, okay? Um, so Beaujolais is, a city, is, is located north of, of Lyon and, and south of Burgundy. Um, and again, most of, the, most of uh, Beaujolais is within the Rhone department of the Rhone Ops region and the uh, Saône et Loire department of Burgundy to the north. So the south is part of Rhone, the north is part of Burgundy, with the majority of it being in, in the Rhone Valley again. It's a very uh, picturesque region. Um, and the vines were planted there by, by the Romans when they started to when they started to conquer Gaul. Uh, the most important Roman vineyard was uh, uh, Brulacius, located on the hillside of Mont Bruy, which actually Mont Bruy is, uh, or Bruy is a subregion of the, uh, a subregion of Beaujolais today. Uh, from the seventh century through the Middle Ages, most of the viticulture and winemaking was done by Benedictine monks. Um, in the 10th century, the region got its name uh, from the town of Beaujau uh, from in the Rhone Valley and was ruled by the Lords of Beaujau until the 15th century when it was ceded to the uh, Duchy of, of Burgundy. Uh, I'll get all through all this boring stuff in a little bit. Uh, the wines from Beaujolais were mostly confined to the markets along the uh, Town and Rhone uh, rivers, uh, particularly in the town of Lyon. Like I said, in Lyon, France, Beaujolais is the, the pretty much the everyday wine in that area. Uh, the expansion of the French railroad system in the 19th century opened up the lucrative Paris market and the wines uh, started to become very popular in Paris restaurants and cafes and things like that. And the cool thing about Beaujolais, it's pretty, um, it can be pretty light bodied and, and really fruity uh, for, for a red wine. And because of that, it can, it can pair with a, a large variety of, of different foods. And I've been getting, I'm, I've been getting a bit more into it within the last few years and I can, I can tell you that um, typically the wine doesn't disappoint, especially for, for the price that you pay for it. Um, the first mention of Beaujolais wine in English followed soon after when Cyrus Redding, who was a big, uh, a huge wine critic, uh, described the wines of Moulin Avant and Saint Amour as being low priced and best consumed young. Um, but in the 1980s, Beaujolais hit a, hit a peak of popularity in the world's wine market with its Beaujolais Nouveau wine. Um, and Beaujolais Nouveau is a, is a very specific uh, kind of wine. It's a, a, a premier wine or the first wine of the season. 
and we'll talk a little bit about how that's different than than a regular wine. And, and I would have liked to try Beaujolais Nouveau today. The the issue with that is Beaujolais Nouveau is a wine that is meant to be drinking young, and the majority of it is sold within you know six months of its release. And, it, and actually, it's one of those wines that after six six months or so, the quality starts to diminish after a while. So um, if you're gonna get, drink Beaujolais, if you wanna drink Beaujolais Nouveau, um, it'll be on the market in the third week of November. Uh, so when we talk about Beaujolais du, uh, Nouveau, one of, the, one of the names we typically think about is, is George de Beauf. Uh, he is, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, he is one of the major, what we call negociants. And negociants are basically, um, and, and it, the term negociant can, different, can differ from region to region in France, but certainly in Burgundy and Beaujolais, it's people that buy grapes from different farmers and then they, they make the wine that they bought from those farmers. And if you ever heard of Georges de Boff, you would know that their Beaujolais Nouveau is probably the most popular and the, and the, most, uh, lar the most volume produced of Beaujolais is probably by uh, Georges de Boff, who, who unfortunately passed away in 2010. Um, demand outpaced supply for Beaujolais Nouveau. So what happened was they were trying, they, they capitalized their wines. And, and what capitalization does is if you, if you pick your grapes and they're not at high enough of a ripeness to get to a certain alcohol level, you throw some sugar in there and it'll help get to that, you know, 12 to 14% alcohol that you're, that you're looking for. Um, and this became the trend because again, they were able to produce more wine that way. And, and what happened was the quality started to really, really diminish and the quality of Beaujolais wine as a whole started, started to diminish. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, so far? Um, so after the whole Beaujolais Nouveau flop, uh, what happened was winemakers started to put more emphasis on quality to, to bring uh, the level of Beaujolais back up to uh, a level of respect amongst uh, the, wine, the wine world or amongst wine consumers. Uh, recent years have seen a number of terroir-driven estate bottled wines made from single vineyards or in one of the Cru Beaujolais communes uh, where the name of the commune it is allowed to be displayed on the label. Um, and we'll get into what a Cru Beaujolais is um, pretty soon. And it may, be, it may be difficult for people to recognize some of these wines and to recognize that they're Beaujolais because nowhere on the label does it say um, Beaujolais. And I'll show you, I'll show you an example right now of one of those wines, which we'll be, which we'll be, I'll be try, tasting with you guys today. The 2009 uh, Marcel Lapierre Morgon. And you'll see, I mean, even on the back, it doesn't say anything about Beaujolais. And actually, it, it actually says, if you see in parentheses here, it says, it says Rhone on it because technically it's part of the Rhone more going. So it can get pretty confusing, but that's just uh, kind of the nature of learning about wines, I guess. Um, these days, Beaujolais is well known for producing quality wines, is, is gaining in popularity. I remember, I mean, 10 years ago, really Beaujolais still didn't have the respect that it deserves. And it's a, it's a delicious wine and, and, it, and it should always re be revered as, as one of the world's great wine regions, but um, it really hasn't been until recently that you've been seeing these high quality Beaujolais uh, gain in popularity. Um, so Beaujolais, it is the southernmost district in Burgundy and, uh, and I guess you can say the northernmost district in 
in the Rhone Valley. Um, and it's larger. If you, if you look at, if you look at Burgundy, France, in the very north, you have Chablis, then you have the Côte de Bon, no, I'm sorry, the Côte de Nuit, then you have the Côte de Bon, uh, the Côte Chalonnet, and the Côte Mackinac. So these five different wine producing regions within Burgundy, Beaujolais is bigger than all five of those put together. Um, well, um, they produce they produce more wine than all five of them uh, together, which is which is something to say. Um, the climate of Beaujolais is semi uh, semi continental with some temperate influences and some influences from the Mediterranean. Uh, typically, they have very warm, dry summers and and cold and cold uh, wet winters. Uh, and again, this is pretty typical of of wines that come from this sort of area in France. Um, so the soils of Beaujolais divide the region into northern and southern half with the town of Villefranche uh, serving as a dividing point. The northern half of Beaujolais where most of the Cru Beaujolais communes are located includes rolling hills, schist and granite based soils with some limestone. Uh, and most of the granite and schist is found near the upper slopes with the lower slopes having more stone and clay composition. And most of the higher quality wines are produced on the, uh, the upper slopes. The Southern half of the region known as the Bas Beaujolais or the, the low Beaujolais has flatter terrain and richer sandstone and clay boy soil with some limestone patches. Um, and typically, when you look at regions, uh, wine regions, typically the better wines tend to grow on slopes or, or the, the sides of hills and the more uh, um, wines that don't have as much quality tend to grow on, on flatter lands. And one of those regions, reasons is the, uh, the wines that grow on the, the slopes, they have more, typically have more varied soils and they also have much better drainage. So the water after it rains will, will drain off uh, the soil and the much easier and they get much more sunlight as well. So when we talk about the, the wines of Beaujolais, the first thing we think about is a grape called Gamay. Gamay is the wine, is, I'm sorry, is the grape that is used to make the red wines of Beaujolais and again, 98% of the wines coming from Beaujolais are red wines. Um, so Gamay is actually a cross between Pinot Noir and an ancient white variety called Gruy, which is from uh, Central Europe, probably from around like Germany or Austria. Um, the Gamay grape is thought to have first appeared in, in uh, the south of Bone in, 13, in the 1360s. Um, and this grape was grown all over Burgundy and actually it got its name from, it got its name from the hamlet of Gamay within Bonne, France, which is in, which is in Burgundy. But if you go to Gamay today, there's no Gamay grown there because they ripped out all the vines and plant and replanted them, replanted Gamay in uh, Beaujolais. And what, the one thing about Gamay, it's a very high a grape that has very high yields and it's very, it's very fruity. It's, it's, uh, they eat, it can be an easy drinking wine, although it can, it can be very complex as well. But anyway, what was happening was they're making, they're making all this wine from Gamay in, in Burgundy. And number one, it was lowering the market value of it. And number two, their, their chief, uh, consumers of that were in, were in uh, Avignon, France, which at that time was where the, the Pope lived. Um, and they didn't like the wines from Gamay, so they got rid of the Gamay. And so it was uh, Philip the Bold outlawed, outlawed the cultivation of Gamay at, in, uh, in the area of Bone where, where it was growing. And they took it all and brought it to uh, 
Beaujolais, where, where it thrived and produced much higher quality wines. Um, so again, it's a very vigorous wine. Uh, and it, it definitely had, you can definitely make, um, it definitely, how can I say, it has, again, you can produce a, a large volume of it easier than you could say a wine like, like Pinot Noir. Um, so the grapes, uh, can't, the grapes roots do not grow very deeply, uh, resulting in pronounced hydrological stress on the vines over the growing season uh, with score, uh, correspondingly high level of acids in the grape. And if you like acidity in a wine, um, I, think, I think Beaujolais is a, is a wine you like. And a lot of, a lot of red wines uh, tend to lack acidity nowadays, but the acidity of Beaujolais uh, helps to make it a very, a very food fr friendly wine and a very, uh, uh, sort of cleansing wine. Uh, so Gamay or Gamay Noir or, or Gamay Noir Joux Blanc, often it's referred to and the Joux Blanc means that it has white juice in it. There's another, uh, there's another sort of Gamay out there. It's called Gamay de Bouzy, uh, which is a, uh, a Tien Terrier grape, which means that the flesh has color in it as well. And what that does to a wine is uh, it, adds, it adds a deeper color to the wine. And only 10% only of the, only 10 of the grapes in Beaujolais are, are allowed to be Gamay de Bouzy. Um, so wines of Beaujolais are, tend to be different than other types of, of, of red wines, tend to have a fresher flavor because of a process that's called uh, carbonic maceration. Has anyone, has anyone heard of carbonic maceration before? Did we talk about it in class? Yeah, we did, not, not, for, not too long, but, but briefly. Um, carbonic maceration is a, uh, it's a sort of, it's a whole bunch fermentation, which means that you just take all the grapes on their bunches, you, you throw them in the, the tank or whatever. And what happens is the grapes on the bottom start to, to, to break and they start to ferment a little bit. So what you do when you do, when you put it in the tank, you, you cover the tank right away to make it um, as free of oxygen as possible. And what happens is, is the CO2 that is, that is the product of fermentation that's coming out of the grapes at the bottom starts, starts to get into the, the, uh, the unbroken grapes or the whole grapes. And it starts to have an intercellular fermentation or a fermentation inside of the fruit itself. So it's fermenting even though the berry is not crushed. So what that does is just creates a much uh, fruitier sort of flavor in the wine. Um, and again, other people do use carbonic maceration, but it's most associated with Gamay and is most, which is most associated with, with Beaujolais. Um, so when we think of wines with carbonic, carbonic maceration, some of, some of the flavors people think about, and this is, especially true when it comes to Beaujolais Nouveau. And I don't know if anyone, I know a few of you have been in class with me, but I don't know if, if you've ever had a Beaujolais Nouveau that tasted kind of like bubble gum or, or banana or banana strawberry candy or something like that. And there are some, some vintages of Beaujolais Nouveau where, where it, it definitely smells like banana runs when you're, when you're uh, smelling the wine, it's, it's crazy. Um, and that really isn't looked at as a, I mean, by most people, it's not really looked at as a positive characteristic in a wine if it, if it kind of knocks you over the head. But um, it is something you will find in, in wines using carbonic maceration. 
uh, and the bubble gum thing too. Kirsch, um, which one of the wines we're, we're tasting today has a lot of uh, uh, flavor in it. So has anyone, has anyone drinking Kirsch before or used Kirsch for, for cooking or baking or anything? It's a, a, a cherry, a cherry sort of liqueur um, produced in Germany, I believe. Um, but you definitely get those characteristics from, from carbonic maceration. So let me, uh, I'm gonna show this quick video on our car carbonic, or before I talk about carbonic, I'm also gonna talk about uh, malolactic. Um, so they go, they, the carbonic maceration sort of so, uh, softens the acid a little bit, but then they further put it through malolactic fermentation, which malolactic fermentation occurs when uh, fermentation, when you start to bring the fermentation to a higher temperature. And typically almost all, all red wines go through malolactic fermentation because they're fermented at, at higher temperatures. And some white wines go through malolactic fermentation, some don't. One white wine that typically goes through mallow is uh, Chardonnay. And malolactic fermentation is the process of, of converting malic acid into lactic acid. So when a wine goes through this, especially white wines, you'll get that lactic, buttery, uh, creamy sort of uh, feel in the wine when it goes to malolactic. So most red wines do this, some white wines do this, um, but it definitely helps to take the edge off the wine. Carbonic maceration really helps to uh, preserve some of those beautiful fruit flavors in the wine. I'll play this quick video for you. Carbonic maceration is a form of uh, fermentation. It's different from your standard fermentation, which is yeast fermenting sugar and grape juice, and the fact that it happens intercellular inside the grape. We bring the grapes in, we leave them whole, we dump them in by gravity into a tank, where they remain largely intact inside a tank. We seal the tank as the weight of those grapes kind of crushes. There is some juice that is released and that is in the bottom of the tank. The modern way in Beaujolais or in the Loire Valley is to pump in CO2 gas. What we do is a very old school method where we're actually taking like a pied de cuve of some fermenting grape juice and we're pumping that into the bottom of the tank. It starts to meld with the fresh juice in the bottom from that tank. That fermentation creates heat. The heat is very good for the intracellular fermentation that's taking place inside the berry. It's also creating a lot of carbon dioxide naturally and all that carbon dioxide is filling the tank and pushing the oxygen out. It needs to be an oxygen free environment in order for intracellular fermentation to take place successfully. The presence of oxygen can really create a lot of bad issues in any form of wine making for the most part, but particularly with carbonic maceration. We typically give the wine six to eight days depending on the temperature and how big the tank is and how things are tasting. Essentially, once the tank is filled and it is without any oxygen and we have that process going for seven days, then that juice is pulled out, we open the tank, we shovel out the whole berries, we press that. The wines tend to be a little lighter, a bit more fresh, and that's what we're looking for. questions about carbonic maceration? Um, so the, the characteristics of the wines in Beaujolais, uh, the flavors you tend to taste are 
for me, I get a lot of cherry, but you also get those other red fruits like cranberry and, and raspberry, uh, more of those like tart sort of fruits. But you can get, you can get some, more, some dark fruits in there as well, depending on uh, the way, depending on the way that the, the wine is produced. Um, acidity tends to be pretty high for, for red wines. Um, tannin tends to be low. Alcohol is between 10 and 13%. Um, and these wines are typically drinking, uh, well, the lower level Beaujolais, like the, the tip regular Beaujolais or, or Beaujolais Nouveau, typically drink drunk and a little chilled. Um, Beaujolais Viage and the Beaujolais Cru, I, I tend to drink at, at cellar temperature. So in the, you know, mid 60s, high, high 60 degrees, you know, you, but you don't want to drink wine warm. Um, definitely, uh, I feel like a lot of people, particularly with red wines, drink them too warm. And when you drink your red wine too warm, your alcohol content in there is going to be very pronounced and you're not going to be able to taste a lot of those uh, other facets of the wine. But on the other hand, if you drink it too close, if you drink it too cold, the wine may tend to be a little bit uh, closed. So uh, typically I like to pull it out of the cellar. Right now my cellar is at probably, you know, in the 50s. I'll pull it up for a few minutes and, uh, and it'll be perfect. And, and if you buy Beaujolais from the store, typically what you want to do is stick it in, stick it in the refrigerator for uh, 20, 30 minutes before you, before you drink it to get it to sort of that cellar temperature. Um, so when we look at Beaujolais wines, okay, this is sort of the breakdown of how much wine is produced in each category. So, and I hate to say at the lowest level, let's just, let's call it the most simple level. We have regular Beaujolais, Be Beaujolais Nouveau and Beaujolais Rosé. One thing that we don't see on here is, uh, is Beaujolais Blanc, which makes up 2% of the wines in, in Beaujolais. Um, then we get a little higher in quality, Beaujolais Viage. And, and you know, sometimes there'll be a Beaujolais Viage that'll be higher quality than a, than a Beaujolais Cru. And sometimes there'll be a Beaujolais that'll be higher than quality than a Beaujolais Viage. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a variance in there for sure. Um, but when we talk about Beaujolais Cru, and when we talk about when we talk about cru in France or cru in Burgundy, cru refers to, typically refers to a vineyard. But here in Beaujolais, cru is referred to as entire villages. So these are entire villages that are known for their quality. Now, all of these villages are located in the northern part of, of the Beaujolais region and the wines that are labeled as regular Beaujolais are in the, in the more Southern part. And the, and the Beaujolais, Beaujolais Viage is kind of spread throughout the South and the North. So these are the, the 10 Beaujolais crews. And you'll see it right here. I got this, I got this off of winefolly.com. You'll see right here, this is has the bolder wines being Moulin Avant, which is typically always agreed to as being the boldest, the biggest style of, of Beaujolais Cru. Then we have Morgon, which we're gonna taste one of those today. Uh, uh, Julien Asse, um, Bruy, all right? And then the middle of the road sort of body ones would be Cote de, Cote de Bruy, Renier, Chenas, and then the lighter wines would be uh, Cheruble, Fleury, and Saint Amour. And I can tell you this, you can look at this list and you can think like, hey, I'm going to buy uh, uh, a Fleury and it's going to be really light and it could wind up being full bodied. These are just generalizations that people make. Um, and I've seen, I've seen many lists of Beaujolais crew put in order from, from bold to light or from light to bold. And I really don't think that most of those lists are accurate, but I shared this one with you just to 
just to show you a list, um, each wine from from different winemakers will be will be much different. And I can tell I can I got a wine that I drank the other day right here at Chateau Chateau Pizai uh, Morgon, and today we're gonna drink the La Pierre Morgon. And I can tell you these the all all these wines have something in common, but these two wines I thought were very different from each other uh, for a very specific reason, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so here's a, here's a more in-depth map of, of uh, Beaujolais. And you can see this big light orange area right here. This is the area where Beaujolais and Beaujolais Nouveau come from, okay? So 50% of the wines that come from, uh, that come from Beaujolais are either Beaujolais or Beaujolais Nouveau. And then we have in this darker orange area, this is where the Beaujolais Viage wines come from. And you can see the Beaujolais Viage are nestled right along all these 10 Beaujolais uh, crews right here. Um, oops. So to the very north, we have uh, Cherouble, Saint Amour, Chenas, and we have Fleury, well, Mounolvan, uh, Cherouble, Morgon, Rignier, Bruy, and then we see Cote de Bruy is right in the center. So the Cote de Bruy is looked to be a little more, uh, have a little bit better terroir, or if you, if you haven't heard the, the term terroir before, that is sort of the, the marriage of, or, or the holistic view of the soil, the topography, the weather, the climate, the grapes that grow well in that climate, all of that, all of those factors are what we call um, terroir. But anyway, you can see how large the, uh, the area that produces regular Beaujolais and Beaujolais Nouveau are. And so the basic Beaujolais AOC is uh, made up of 96 villages, but essentially covering 60 villages and refers to all basic Beaujolais wines. Um, a large portion of the wines uh, made in this appellation sell as Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, the appellation averages around 75 million bottles of wine in production a year. So that, that's quite a bit. Um, and then we have Beaujolais Viage, which is the intermediate category, um, which, which accounts for about a quarter of the production. Um, some some Beaujolais Viage is sold as Beaujolais Nouveau. So sometimes you'll say, you'll see a wine labeled as Beaujolais Viage Nouveau, which is a Nouveau wine that comes from the, the Beaujolais Viage appellations. It's not, it's not very common, but you do see it sometimes. Uh, the terrain of this region is hillier with more schist and granite uh, than the regular Beaujolais AOC. Um, the grapes from the area of a single vineyard commune, uh, producers can affix a name of the particular village to the Beaujolais Viage designation. You don't really see that to happen too often, but uh, sometimes you'll see uh, a vineyard name connected to the Beaujolais Viage designation. Um, so an interesting thing uh, several communes in, in the Beaujolais uh, Viage AOC qualified to produce their wines under the Mac Mackinac or St. Veron AOCs. So in the north of, in the north of uh, Beaujolais, it's kind of right within the south of Burgundy, right where Mackinac and, and uh, another AOC St. Veron are. St. Saint Veron is a, is a, is an area within the Mackinac, and some of the areas within Beaujolais can label their wines as Mackinac or 
or, or St. Ferran. Um, so a little bit about uh, Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, it is the most popular, what we call Vendu Premier uh, in, the, in the world or Premier wine in the world. Uh, and it's just fermented for a few weeks before being released for sale and always on the, on the third Thursday of November. Um, and it wasn't always that way. It, in 1937, when Beaujolais first became a AOC, it was officially sold after the 15th of December. Then they got a little bit more lax and they, they moved it up to the, the 15th of November. And then in 1985, uh, they moved it up to the third week of November or the third Thursday in November. And that again was to market it for Thanksgiving. So, you know, Beaujolais, the Thanksgiving wine, um, and it definitely does go very good with Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but that was, that was a marketing ploy to, to, uh, to sell more of, of the wines and Beaujolais, uh, the significance of it was they, uh, when, when the, when they first released it, they had race car drivers that, that were in competition to see who could, who could get the first bottles of Beaujolais Nouveau to Paris first and, and be, and this created all sorts of celebrations and, and different things across the world connected with Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, and again, it's a very youthful wine, a wine that can, again, have that banana, strawberry, uh, fruit punchy sort of characteristic. So it's not, you know, a lot of people sort of this on uh, Beaujolais Nouveau, but it's actually, it can be a pretty good wine, but it's a wine that you just, you know, you want to drink, you want to drink chilled, drink fast and drink a lot of, I guess. So any, any questions thus far? Please. Anybody? Okay. So now we're going to talk about the most serious uh, type of um, Beaujolais, which is what we call Beaujolais Cru. Um, and on here, I have all of the different characteristics of of the different crew, I'm not I'm not going to go through and read all of them, but you just kind of have to, if you if you want to get to become familiar with the different crews, the only thing you can really do is 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 drink them. And I can tell you, if if you become interested in Beaujolais and you decide, you know, to read publications and stuff and read about the different characteristics. <laughs> different Beaujolais have, it can, it can be really confusing because there's a lot of people that have different opinions about it. Um, but the most common opinion is the wines of Moulavant uh, typically are the most structured wines. And when I say, say structured, it's a, it's a hard thing to explain with wine, but wines with a good balance of of alcohol, acid, tannin. Um, that's pretty much what we, what we talk about when we talk about a wine structure, okay? So again, the, these are the 10 crews. Um, so also in Beaujolais, they make what's called Beaujolais Blanc, which makes up only 2% of the, uh, of the production in Beaujolais. And the wines are made from Chardonnay. Um, there's another wine, a uh, grape varietal uh, called Aligote. And vines planted before, before 2004 may be used up until 2024. And on 2024, it's no more. So you really don't see it too much. So um, when you think of when you think of Beaujolais Blanc, you think 100% uh, Chardonnay, okay? And much like in Burgundy, France, it's 100% Chardonnay. Um, and again, a lot of these white wines are grown in the north, in the north of Beaujolais, and they can produce 
they can produce their wines under the label of Macon Viage or saint Veron. And again, 2% of production. So our first, our first wine that we're gonna try, and I don't know if anyone has any wines or does anyone have any like general wine questions outside, outside of Beaujolais wine? So our first wine is going to be uh, Louis Jadot Beaujolais Viage uh, 2019, 100% Gamay as is typical of, of uh, Beaujolais. And let's see now, Um, so, and we're also going to pour a, a, a glass of the 2019 Lapierre Morgan. Now, unexpectedly, and I don't know how well you can see this. Let me, let me go down here. So which one of these wines appears to be lighter and which one appears to be darker? This is, this is the Morgon. And this is the Louis Jadot uh, Beaujolais Viage. Well, I can tell you that, you know, just from the site, the, the, the Louis Jadot is, is a much darker color. Um, and again, remember, the wines from the Cruz are supposed to be the richer, more structured wines, but the color, the color really doesn't tell us that, that this, that this uh, Louis Jadot is going to be um, that it's going to be richer. It's just it's just the color of the grape. One interesting thing, and I didn't know this before I bought it, but this uh, Louis Jadot Beaujolais Viage has no carbonic maceration on it. I thought it was going to be a wine with 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 a high degree of carbonic, but uh, it is it is not. So um, let's give it a try. Now, when we drink our wine. Or first thing we do is we'll again we'll look at the color. This the color of this is like a, a dark ruby with a little with a little purple in there. So I'll I'll aerate the wine a little bit and I do that by by swirling it. Then I'll smell it. Mm. And the wine has has a great again a dark a dark cherry sort of sort of uh, aroma to it. And it's just really fresh and fruity, um, and this 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 wine has a little dark fruit in it too. And if you if you look at the color, if you if you were here and you saw the color of it, uh, you would see that it that it is it is a little bit uh, has a little bit of a purpley color on the wine. So now I taste it, and as I taste as I'm as I'm sipping the wine, I I, I breathe in as well, get more of the the aroma. And on the palate, it's, it's a pretty acidic wine. Um, it definitely has uh, a, a, a good amount of acidity. Tannin is medium. So if you don't like wines that like make, make your mouth dry out too much, you would, you would really enjoy this one. And on the palate, I get again, some cherry again, but also another thing I get on this wine is like a, a nice, a little bit of earthiness. I get some, and when I say earthiness, I mean like uh, if you, I guess the best way I can describe it is, uh, you know, like, like wet cement sort of thing, or even like 
the smell of soil. Uh, and this wine, the, the great thing about this wine is it's only $12.99. And I can tell you there's a lot of $40 wines that, that may not give you the, the pleasure of that, that this wine does. And again, no, no carbonic maceration. So you don't, you don't really get, you really don't get that, um, any of those banana sort of uh, really over the top fruit characteristics, but it is a really nice wine. It has a little bit of, a little bit of weight to it, a little bit of uh, creaminess to it. And I would say that it's probably medium body. I'd say it's medium bodied uh, and acid is like medium high. Really, really nice wine. What's the alcohol percentage? Don't look. 13, 13.5. 13. I'm not lying here. Take a look. I know. You're good at that. I know you are. <laughs> yeah, we used to have a lot of fun with that. Well, but the thing is, when you learn about wine, you can you can know something about the wine before even tasting it. So so I know because it's it's because it's Beaujolais, it's not going to be super high in alcohol, and it's it's probably not going to be anything lower than twelve percent. So just knowing by virtue of where it comes from, you can you can sort of take a guess before before you even taste the wine. But but it does, you know when I tasted it, it seemed like it was on the higher spectrum of, of alcohol that you would have for a, uh, for, a Bo for a Beaujolais. And again, this is a wine that you can find anywhere. Beaujolais, Beaujolais Viage is, I think, well, not, I'm sorry, uh, Louis Jadot, it, I think he's like the second, it's like the second or first uh, largest uh, negociant farm, uh, firm in Burgundy. And they have a huge array of wines that they that they bottle. And and one thing I can say, they're always high quality, and typically they're very reasonably priced for what they are. And at twelve ninety nine for this bottle, I would say I would say it's a steal. Um, very very good wine. Um, and now for this for this next wine, the the Marcel uh, Lapierre. Uh, uh, La Pierre Morgon, um, and let me let me go back on these slides a little bit because I, I seem to have skipped through some. Oh, here we go. The producers. So uh, when we talk about Beaujolais, there is a there is a guy named Joël uh, uh, Chauvet, um, which was one of the the fathers of the French natural wine movement. Now a lot of people have a misconception about natural. So typically they think it has no sulfur in it or, or that sort of thing. But um, basically natural wine is just wine getting, getting back to like not using pesticides and, you know, going back to using more primitive sort of farming techniques, using biodynamic uh, techniques in farming. Um, and Jules Chauvet was, was like the, the person in Beaujolais that really, really started saying, you know what, we're producing too much crappy uh, mass produced wines. We got to get back. We got to get back to our roots and start producing uh, really high quality wines. And there is a wine uh, importer and you'll see right here on the back of this bottle of Morgon, uh, Kermit Lynch. I know it's backwards, but Kermit Lynch was one of the first uh, U.S. wine importers that really, really started to see the quality of Beaujolais, and he was the first one to bring in what what is now known as 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 a gang of four: La Pierre, uh, Breton, uh, Devinet, and uh, Foyard are four of the sort of um, how do I say it. Uh, the sort of mavericks on bringing uh, high quality Beaujolais. Well, certainly Kermit Lynch felt strongly about it because he brought them to this country, but they, these are people that were really passionate about making high quality uh, 
wines, and I won't call them natural wines. I call them wines with with minimal intervention. You know, wines that aren't played with too much. Because because if you if you play with wines too much, you know, you you can wind up making them all taste the same. Okay, um, or if you process wines too much. So this wine, uh, the Lapierre uh, Morgon, is made from partial uh, carbonic maceration or semi-carbonic maceration. Now, uh, there is no such thing as full carbonic maceration. You can't make a wine uh, with full carbonic maceration. What, what, what's done with this wine is the wine starts off with carbonic maceration, and then after they get that characteristic, they crush the grapes or they press the grapes uh, ferment them with their skins, and they make wine in the traditional uh, fermentation style. So it'll have characteristics from the carbonic and from from the regular. Um, and this wine right here, I wish I wish you can smell it. And we talked about uh, how carbonic can give something a Kirsch smell. If, when you smell this wine, it smells it smells like a beautiful sort of uh, cherry liqueur. It just kind of kind of hits you hits you over the head it's like it's so i can't explain to you like how beautiful this wine smells so you get that you get that cherry but you also get like this like rose petal and 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 like cooked strawberry it's it's really really um a very polished clean uh i mean i, I just want to smell it i don't i don't even know if i want i don't even know if i want to drink the wine it's so it smells so good, but yeah, what what a what a delicious wine has some some spice in it too, like a little a little bit of a little bit of cinnamon in there. And I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, and and I I mean, but but you really can you really can smell these things. Um, so let me uh, give it a taste. And again, good acidity. Um, tannin is about the same, um, but this this is a much like fuller wine. It, well, and again, we'll talk about structure. It it hits more. It hits it hits on more of those different things that that you're looking for. I think I think this wine is a little more complete. Although this wine, the first. Oh, my battery's low on my on my computer. My the first wine is a little bit. Um, the first wine is a little more. Uh, like how can I how can I explain it? A little richer, I guess you can say, but this one has has a better structure all all around. I don't know. I just had it fully charged, so let me. I might have to change to a different room before it goes off. Um, so. Definitely, definitely a beautiful wine. The difference is, is that first wine costs thirteen dollars, and this the second wine, the Morgon, is at a, a much higher price point. You can find it from, you know, like thirty five. I paid I paid forty one for it, um, but I can I can tell you this much. Uh, I've had a lot of wines that cost more than forty one dollars that that don't even come close to the to the pleasure I get from from this wine, mm. you get some cranberry on there again. Those nice tart uh, red berry flavors, um, but it's so it's so fruity and delicious that you almost get like a feeling of sweetness from it, even though it's completely completely dry. No no residual sugar in this wine whatsoever, but it's just so it's so fun to drink. And, and, and when you smell it, it, you almost get a feeling because it's so like light and you get that feeling of acidity in there. You almost feel like it's going to have like effervescence to it or something, but, but it really doesn't. Okay. So now for a third wine, which is probably the rarest wine of the bunch, uh, is a Beaujolais Blanc made by Georges Decombes, which this wine is 100% Chardonnay, um, and uh, Georges de Combes is a disciple of 
of the Gang of Four, particularly he worked for and worked with uh, uh, Marcel Lapierre for a number of years and his and the way he makes wines is is heavily influenced by um, by Lapierre. Um, so let me pour this wine real quick. And again, pretty pretty light in color. I mean, it is white, so that is to be expected, but very clear. Um, and again, uh, one thing about this wine in particular, the the La Pierre is not filtered, um, so they don't put it through a filtration process. They just they just let all of the the solids and impurities settle to the bottom of the tank and and get all the 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 wine off of off of that. Um, so again, the Georges de, de Combes, uh, um, Beaujolais Blanc, 100% Chardonnay, sort of has like this, uh, I don't know, I just call it a straw, a straw sort of color. Um, mm. But very, very nice aroma to the wine. Um, I'm gonna actually move so I can get hooked up to a battery source, sorry. Okay. All right. So here we go. I'm actually, for those of you who don't know, the reason I'm doing this at home is I'm actually on on the quarantine right now. I'm not I'm not sick or I don't I didn't test positive for COVID, but I came into contact with someone, so I have to quarantine for um, two weeks, and I'm. I'm actually not in my house right now. I'm actually at my, uh, my family has a, a farmhouse here in, in Delhi. I live in Oneonta. But anyway. I was wondering, Soma, because I didn't see your basement bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's where I normally would. Well, I, I was supposed to do it up on campus, but, but um, you know, I can't go on campus for, for another week. So this is the. George de Combes, uh, Beaujolais Blanc. George de Combes. Really, really nice uh, perfume on the wine. You get like this silkiness from it. So I'm going to guess that this wine has had a little bit of malolactic fermentation because it has that creaminess and or um, had a lot of... Uh, influence from the leaves on the wine or the or the dead yeast there's a technique called batonnage where when the wine is uh aging you stir around you, you stir around the dead yeast cells and it and it uh incorporates into the wine and gives it a sort of richness on the on the nose i get this beautiful like baked apple sort of characteristic some citrus um and typically i think apple is something you typically get from from Chardonnay, some pear, and then mm. good acidity on the palate. Um, Victor, can I see the label on the bottle? Mm -hmm. Of the white wine, please. I'll get. I'll get all. I'll get all of them for you. Great. Well, sorry, folks, he disappeared. Yeah. This, uh, <laughs> okay. And who's talking? It's Bruce Jones, chef. Nice okay. to see you. Same here. Nice to see you, too. Um, thank you. This is, this is the, the, the Georges de Combes uh, Beaujolais Blanc, um, 2017. And I can tell you it's like, I mean, it tastes like, it tastes like Burgundy from, from the south, from the south of Burgundy, which it pretty, which it pretty much is. Same grape varietal. Um, these grapes come from the area right around um, Mackinac. And if you, if you know a little bit about uh, Macanay, that's where, uh, if you heard of the wine, 
Pui Fuse. Pui Fuse is a is a village in in uh, in Macon. So um, again, really really nice wine. I, I I think I overpaid for this wine a little bit. I think you can probably find it for like for like twenty five bucks. I paid thirty for it, but um, it's uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm not crying about it because it's it's yeah, <laughs> and you can't and and you know it's not easy to find. It's 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 definitely not an easy wine to find. I mean, again, uh, only two percent of the of the uh, production of Beaujolais. So um, it's a uh, it's a it's a treat when you can find it. Yeah, the label helped me. That's why I need, it was difficult to Google it and and to find any in stock. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't even see it at Sherry Lehman in Manhattan. Yep. Um, yep. Um, yeah, I didn't. I actually I bought this in Delhi. There's a there a, a store Dixie's. They're they're actually closing, and I went in there and I I bought I bought two bottles of it, um, and it's one it's one of the better. I mean, I've had good Beaujolais Blanc. I don't think I've had bad Beau, Beaujolais Blanc, but um, this is. This is a very this is a very pleasant wine, um, and I think I think it's a wine that will please a lot of of different people because if you if you like Chardonnay, it has a little bit of that that weight that Chardonnay typically has, but if you really don't like like the heavy oaky sort of Chardonnays, this this definitely isn't that. Although it has a little bit of uh, oak influence, it's 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 barely uh, it's not too detectable. I'll say. But I guess it, that depends from person. That differs from person to person. But I like. I think it's cool to you know. For me, of course, I love the taste. the The way that wine tastes, um, the way it smells, the way it makes you feel. And I think a lot of people are just like, before they start to enjoy wine, they're they're really worried about. I have to learn about wine. But you really don't have to, you really don't have to know much about it to be able to enjoy it. I think, I think the journey of of learning about it uh, can come after you you enjoy it. If if that makes if that makes any sense, you don't need yeah, to know it makes a lot, yeah. you know, or yeah. where it comes from or what soils it grows in uh, to be able to enjoy it. But I think once you do enjoy wine and you start to you start to learn about the history and the way the wines are made and the people behind the wine, then not only do you have the, not only do you get to enjoy the way it tastes, not only do you get to enjoy the way it, it smells, but you also have an intellectual enjoyment that goes along with it. Because you, know, I, you can buy a bottle of wine and then you can sit down and you can read about it and learn the history of it and all those sort of things. So, so um, you know, there's a lot of wines that I drink that maybe they're not my preference, but I appreciate it because of the history behind it and how the history uh, sort of made that wine into what it is today. And, and, and if you look at what we talked about Beaujolais, um, history has a lot to do with why it even exists. You know, all those, all those uh, Gamay vines, you know, I mean, it definitely affected Burgundy because there's no Gamay grown in Burgundy where it's originally from. And it all got moved to the, the south to Beaujolais. And, um, and now we have what is, what is modern Beaujolais. And, and the cool thing is, is uh, I think, you know, you see when we talk about wine today, it's, it's, uh, it's even more difficult to to learn about and to comprehend all the different regions because there's it's it's growing so much and there's so much there's so many new uh wine areas sprouting throughout throughout the world that for me personally i find myself when i'm when i'm drinking wines instead of instead of getting wines from established areas i'm buying wines from like cool places in the south of france that cost a lot less money than wines from from the established regions of France like like Burgundy or Bordeaux or you know those, those are the first two that champagne um, so I don't know it's kind of an adventure I think so, 
Does anyone have any other questions or like about about Beaujolais or just French wine or any type of wine in, in general? Hey, Victor, I'd like to step up and say you did a great job today. I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm Jackson Lamb, class mm -hmm. of 73, tenured professor, Metropolitan State University of Denver, and I am teaching Burgundy this Wednesday. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. Yeah. So Good as a reason. matter of fact, we actually talked about Beaujolais Nouveau last week. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost a dead thing now, but uh, you're right, in the 80s, it was a, a heralded thing. And I remember that a couple of the restaurants in Denver, they, they were tracking the Beaujolais coming across, you know, on United Airlines and landing in Denver. It's coming, it's coming. Yep, 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 and yep, so yep. there was so much hype about it. And so uh, anyway, it was just, uh, uh, we talked about it in class last week, but this week we're getting into uh, a Pinot Noir specifically. But mm. it's just great to, uh, you really delved into it. I loved your PowerPoint, nicely done. Oh, thank you. And you know, the thing is, you know, one thing about um, Beaujolais, Beaujolais and, and some Gamay, you know, for example, this, uh, I mean, both of them have some, some Pinot Noir sort of, sort of characteristics to it, you know, and people, sure. If you like, if you like Pinot, you'll probably like, uh, probably like Beaujolais for sure. You know, yeah. it, it, but it, you know, it's definitely, a, as, as you know, a, a, a bit more fruity, not as, not as earth driven, but, but I mean, you can't, you can't get your hands on a, a, a great bottle of Burgundy for, for less than 70 bucks, but you can. You're absolutely right. And even though the Beaujolais is, is heralded, it's only eight weeks old. Right? It's just, it's young. It's, mm -hmm. it's the product of the recent crush and, yep. uh, Anyway, very young, very fruity, very fun. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you, and George DeBook, you're absolutely right. It was just a bunch of hype. And uh, yep. that's, that's marketing. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Very but, good. Uh, oh. Well, thanks. So, um, I, I'm, I, does anyone have any, any more questions, I guess? I, I know there's a few of us still here. Yeah, hi Victor. This is Molly. Um, hey Molly. Thank you much for today. I am curious about how you chose the order of how to taste wines. Um, when we've gone to a tasting, we usually do the white first. Yeah, I mean, I I just I just did the reds first today because because I wanted to. Uh, how can I say it? Because reds are more uh, pop. It's a, it's a main, it's what they mainly produce in Beaujolais, so I want to get through those four first and then I did the Beaujolais Blanc which which kind of isn't as important but with that being said a lot of people uh have different opinions about that certainly when I do an organized tasting with my with with my students I'll do I'll do uh white first and then red but sometimes it's nice to 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 have white after red because that that acidity is sort of, sort of uh, cleansing, and and uh, what what can what can happen sometimes, and and it can go either way. But if you're tasting like say high acid white wines, and you and you and you drink a bunch of them, and then you move on to the to the red wines, the red wines can then have the the you can give you the impression of of being flabby or being being too low in acid. So. I know there's a lot of different ways that people like to do it. There is no right or wrong way, but but typically I do do uh, the white wines first. Um, uh, and but but with that being said, if I have sweet red wines, I typically might you know do the do the whites, do the reds, have everyone drink a little bit of water, and then and then move on to the to the sweeter styles of of white wines because. Um, you know, the, the sweetness could sort of uh, mess, um, give your palate different perceptions of, of things. I always joke around with, with students and I say, you know, so, so what is it like when you, when you brush your teeth and then you drink orange juice? You know what I mean? It can be kind of a, 
a uh, uh, a bad experience. But I think people do it both ways. But but yes, Molly, I I typically do do whites before before reds. Oh, I, we couldn't actually get the white. I went to the store with your list or the list that came with the uh, sign up, and they were like, "Oh no, we'd have to special order that. You'll never have it in time." So, did you get did you get the two reds? We got um, a different Morgon, um, yep. and have been real, really enjoyed that. That was very nice. What was who is who is who is the producer of the Morgon? Uh, the label says, well, let's see, Anna Bachelet, mm -hmm. uh, Le Charme, perhaps. Okay, so so was it. Did you feel like it was, and, and did you get another, did you get an, uh, another Beaujolais, like a, a Beaujolais or a Beaujolais uh, Biage? Uh, we didn't, there's only the two of us and we didn't want to. Uh... <laughs> I gotcha, I gotcha. Get you carried away. <laughs> but yeah, more, more gone. See, see this, this, this more gone. And I, and I was talking about the other more gone that I had. Um, let me, let me grab the bottle real quick. Um, Well, this is a, as about interactive as we could be. How about that? So. I'm upset that I didn't look at the list before and I went and bought a Gewürz demeanor. As long as you got some wine with you. As long true, as you got some wine. True, Victor, yeah. So. And it's made from Washington State. Cool. I'm just impressed that you could pronounce that. So that's very good. It's all <laughs> thanks to Somo. <laughs> this, this is a uh, Chateau de, de Pinsai uh, Morgon, and this wine, uh, it was much. I mean, actually, and it, it was twenty four. It was twenty four dollars versus the 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 La Pierre, which was which was a bit more expensive, but it was definitely much more uh, full body. Um, whereas this, whereas this one I'm drinking now, the La Pierre. Yeah just really light and elegant um it would remind you of of sort of a lighter style of of pinot noir in a way yeah exactly and uh you know no, no data required okay so, stop share so, yeah, now I'm drinking the, but so you see the difference of the two reds now? This lighting is actually better. This right here, the one I'm swirling, that's the Morgon. And this is the Beaujolais Viage. So the Beaujolais Viage is much darker uh, wine. And the Beaujolais Viage, let, let's see. Well, I guess it's the way the lighting is, but it, it it's or definitely much Riedels. But again, the 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 Jadot Beaujolais Viage didn't see any any carbonic. It was fermented in a traditional uh, Burgundian style. But both very good. And uh, I know for me personally. My favorite, my favorite price range of, of wines to drink is, are wines between the uh, um, the twelve to twenty five dollar price point, you know, um, because because if you if you if it's great, then it's really great because it's not that expensive, and if it's if it's something you don't like too much, then well, at least you didn't spend too much. At least you didn't spend too much money for it. Good. All right. Well, if 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 you're, I don't know if we're done, or does anyone else have anything uh, to add? No, thank you very much. It's Molly again. We uh, we share your price point desires there. And <laughs> can you um, can you tell from the label about the you mentioned the maceration and the fermentation? Is there a way to tell? No, you got it. You got to read about it. And I've been going crazy. Uh, trying to find some information on on some of these wines today. I mean, uh, I mean, you can know by the wine by the wine producer what by the by the producer what their what style or how they like to uh, 
make their wines if you've if you've had their wines before or if you if you know anything about them. But I was very surprised again about the Louis Jadot Beaujolais Viage having no about having no carbonic. Um, but um, it still it still tastes like Beaujolais though I can I can I can tell you that. But I was hoping that one of the wines would have that sort of over the top uh, fruit punchy banana candied strawberry sort of flavor to it, but it didn't happen. But yeah, there's, there's some, I mean, some, some winemakers or, or some wines will put the, the facts on the back of the label. Um, but I find with a lot of the more, uh, the, the more prestigious wines won't put too much information on it. But if, let me, uh, I'll be right back. I got a bottle I'll grab. I don't think he saw your question yet, Hans Jackson, but I'm sure he'll share. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Uh, he did a very good job. Yeah. So, so this, this wine right here, which is, which is a wine I, I'm, I'm drinking a lot of because it's, it's $12.99 a bottle and they, I live pretty closely to the liquor depot in Oneonta. So uh, this one is a, uh, 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 Barbera de Monferrato from the Piemonte region of Italy. Um, and it's, it's made by the Marchese di Barolo, which, which is a pretty famous maker of, of Barolo. But on the back of this wine, it gives all of that type of information. This Barbera is sourced from the calcareous clay soils that are rich in quartz sand, lending the wine a strong yet blackened character in an open bouquet. Handpicked grapes, you know, it goes through the whole thing, aromas of berries and stuff. And I think when you see wines that are a little bit lower priced, they'll tend to have those descriptions because they're making it because they want to market it to people that maybe are unsure about what this wine is going to taste like. So they can look at the back. Would you put that uh, label up, Victor, so I can snap a picture of it? Yep. And if you go. Thank you. Got it. Oh, that's yeah, perfect. I <laughs> yeah, I, I might as well steal uh, Jackson from the best, right? Why no, do the research if I got Victor well, Somo giving me the info? Well, I was going to say, you know, if I needed a, a good idea, I usually ask a 12 year old. So that's a great idea. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Victor, um, uh, there's also a question in the chat. Um, Jackson was wondering if you could share your PowerPoint with them. And I know we'll also be posting our, um, our recordings on the alumni website, too. You know, and, and, and just, just, I don't know. I put the PowerPoint together and I did it pretty quickly, but it's a lot of information that I found from, from different, uh, uh, you know, wine websites like Wine Folly and Guild of Sommeliers. I got, I got some information from Wikipedia on there too. Um, but just to let you know, that's not like my original information. It's, oh no, in, in <laughs> fact, I use Wine Folly all the time. Uh, yeah, that, that Madeline, she's a little crazy out there, but- Oh, she's I, awesome I, though. Oh, but I like the way, I'll tell you, for my students, she's just perfect, you know? She'll mm -hmm. compare a, a, a Burgundy Pinot to Oregon Pinot, you know? what? A, that's another great one. And I, I beam that up and they've got to, okay, watch that video and what's your assessment? So I yep. love those, yeah. Yep. Yeah, she does a great job, and she's got lots I have of great. A question: What's I'm up? allowed to ask one. <laughs> our, yeah, of course. Uh, our two teachers uh, uh, and wine connoisseurs. I'm just wondering: Have you heard much about how the fires in the West will impact the grape um, production in our wine? Um, I know some. I know some vineyards got damaged, but I'm not. I'm not sure of the overall impact it's it's going to have, other than. It's probably going to drive the prices up if, if of the if a, if a lot of the vineyards got ruined and couldn't, and wine. or who knows, it might drive the prices down so they can unload. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good question. We actually had, 
we had that as, as a discussion in my class two weeks ago. And my guest speaker was the, the director of the Colorado Wine Development Marketing Board. And I had said, will that affect the terroir? And the way I phrase it, everybody's just thinking about the smoke and the destruction on the surface. But what about the terroir and all the ash? And it's going to change oh, the composition absolutely. of the soil. Yeah. No, but he said that. He said, that's a billion dollar question. We don't know. This is unprecedented. Yeah. Some of the uh, more expensive vintners in Napa and Sonoma, Jackson, I was reading your article and wine enthusiasts, that's their biggest concern. It's not necessarily the smoke affecting the skins, it's it's the soil, the ash, the yes. runoff from the firefighters, the water, a big concern. I Could know, a, a big concern disaster. is gonna change the phosphate level and everything. And, uh, yeah. you know, I teach some urban ag classes, so I really understand, you know, the balance of what's needed in the soil. And yeah, when I asked that to this, uh, are, and the Colorado wine industry is booming right now. It's uh, they're doing very well. But yeah, all of a sudden we started looking at everybody was looking at it from well, this year's crop is gone. No, what about the terroir? So yeah. that's some that's a that's a good that's a great point. point. Everybody, great one. Wow. Good. Hey, Victor, are you teaching virtually? I assume you are. Yeah. For for um. For the for for my history for the history of wines class virtual, but I was I was teaching because uh, I mainly teach uh, culinary arts. Yep. Uh, I was teaching two labs, but what happened was I was at a I was at a restaurant that had a person that was infected that had a uh, or COVID nineteen, so I was informed that I had to uh, I had to get tested. And I, I, I tested positive, thank God. Um, I think I had it back in February anyway. I know other people say that, but, but I'm yeah. Um, so, and, and the thing is, I know I was pretty close to this person um, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get it. So, so, but um, We're I was, glad you was didn't. teaching, to answer your question, I was teaching two labs in person. Yeah. So yeah. how about on, in your wine class, is that just wine theory? I'm doing a wine tasting class and it's all online. Yeah. Well, I think the thing about the thing about my class right now is we kind of had to think really quick to figure out what to do. So this is just theory right now. But typically, typically we taste. Um, and what I we're gonna those do. Tastings. Yeah, well, you yeah, Sarah took my class. Well, did you when did you take my class, Sarah? Last semester. Last, yeah, last semester. So you only got to, we only did like two tastings. Um, I'll never forget that saw turns. <laughs> and then we finished it. We finished it on online. So what we're going to do next semester is hopefully I'm going to be able to teach the class virtually. But then at some point in the semester, or at the end of the semester, some of the kids will be able to come on campus and we can do like, four or five days of, of, of tasting, you know, because it's kind of, it's kind of pointless if you can't, I mean, what, what is it? Why would, how knowledge of wine and the history and this and the winemaking and, and, and viticulture, it's, it's really not important if you, if you don't get to try the, the product or if you're not. Of course, of I mean, course. You have to, you have to be able to take knowledge and, and see how it relates to what the bottle or, what, or what's in the glass. So um, exactly, exactly. Well, so I'll tell you what we've done. Um, I we, we so first we realized early on we're going to be online all the way. Okay, wine tasting class. What does that look like? So my main objective is to go through eight varietals, four whites and four reds. But mm -hmm. the first five weeks are. All about the basics, the vineyards, the, uh, the names of the wines, the terminology, the service styles, how to open a bottle, all that stuff. Then we get into Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, and then Riesling. So we set it up where the students would come by, uh, kind of like a drive-through. We put the stuff in their trunk, 
but we had one eight sevens and three seven fives. Yeah. We gave every every student two bottles of each varietal. So wow. just like you did your uh, tasting earlier, everybody had, and a, typically it's a Sutter home because <laughs> they make everything. Yeah. And then we could find a three seven five of something that's a little bit nicer, like a Wente Brothers or yeah, uh, something yeah. like a Woodbridge or something along those lines. Yeah. And I'm sticking with the eight main varietals. But at least mm -hmm. when we're tasting, we're using the uh, the flavor wheel from Wine Folly, which you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And we bring in Madeline's comments on everything. But all of a sudden, I've got a two and a half hour class online. Everybody shows up. They have to fill out a sensory analysis profile of the wines when they're done. It's very participatory. And so finally, this week, we're moving into reds, uh, Pinot Noir. But I, that's why I wanted a 10-year wine tasting today, because yeah. I wanted to see what that was all about. So, so do you have... You, for your class, do you have a, a lab fee for the class or anything like that? I guess we do have a lab fee, and that's yep. what enabled us to be able yep. to not only buy the wines, but give the wines to the students. Yep. And in Colorado, because of COVID, they've been rapidly changing the liquor laws uh, to accommodate, you know, keeping restaurants uh, afloat and allowing to go sales. But I think we were already licensed properly so that we could do that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know yet, because we thought of different ways that we could possibly get wine to our students. But you know, the other thing is, you know, you know, some of the kids that take my class aren't of age, so. Yeah. You know. Great. How about the culinary classes? I, I saw that you're you're trying to rearrange your schedule so that instead of uh, four hours a week in labs, it's it's four hours a day trying to get an intensified three weeks. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's been awesome. It's, it's been because yeah. awesome. the, because the retention that of, of knowledge and skills that the, that the students have from, from week, from day to day is so much better than, than the retention of skills and knowledge that they have from week to week. And right. What, oh, I agree. What, what you we know, can I do. Hate to say it, that's the CIA model. They, they're, yeah, no. And we, they'll, you they'll know, get right into it and blast through it. And, and, and it's a model that a lot of us at the, at a lot of us faculty have wanted to, to do for a while. And it just so happens now we're kind of forced to do it, but it, but the, but the, the students leave with such a better skill set. I, I can, I can tell you that with the condensed three week format, their skills are progressing so much faster than they, than they did. Uh, oh, sure. Well, you know, you, you know, you start the stock on one day and you finish it the next. You know, it's that's typically not what we get to do. It's like, okay, see you next week. And then yep. you and I have to clean up the stock. I know yeah, how uh, that goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's great too. And the one thing is too, you know, students work at different paces. So yeah. if they don't get done with something one day, you can be like, don't worry about it. You finish it tomorrow. Yeah. You couldn't say before, don't worry about it. We'll finish it next week because by that exactly. So, <laughs> hey, so how does that work with the housing? So, the, are they in the dorms full time, or do they come back to campus just for that intensified time? Um, what goes so, on? Some, some are some students are staying for on campus for the full semester, even if they don't have lab classes because they have like uh, housing insecurities at home, or or they don't have anywhere else to go. Let's say they. Yeah. Or something here in the sure, international students so yeah where do they go right yeah exactly so but then we have some students yeah they're taking the three-week classes but they'll they're staying on campus for the for the full semester but but every, every i don't know if, i don't know if, if you know more about it lucinda but that's that's kind of every student sort of has a different situation i guess oh sure everybody's trying to adapt it however they can i get it yeah. great terrific yeah. Thank you so much for your time here. That was great. Well, thank, thank you, you. for thank Thanks you for showing up. for everybody's input too. You had some great questions. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Terrific. It's good to see you. Same here, Bruce. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Elmo. Well, Jackson, Thanks, nice Sarah. meeting you, Lucinda. Alrighty, I'm gonna check Sarah. out. Thanks, everybody. Jackson. So where should I send where should I send the uh the bill? Yeah. <laughs> I could share yeah. his I 
Uh, do you want to put your email in the chat, Jackson, or I could forward it to Victor if it's the same that you used to sign up? I can do that, yeah. Um, so I'll put that in there. Yep. And, and Victor, I have some questions, but what I'll do is I'll follow up by email to you uh, probably a Monday or Tuesday, okay? Okay. Regarding anything? Well, I, just some insider information. I'm, I'm really curious. What kind of stipend does hospitality business David give you to purchase all these wines? Is it a handsome sum of money? For my class? Sure. For, uh, for or my even class? your private collection? <laughs> oh, no. I mean, this, I, I, the wines today I paid for. Um, but the, uh, for my class, it's uh, the lab fee is $65 per student, which I wish it was more. But sure, dollars per student. So I get if I have a class of twenty, you know, I get a pretty, I get a pretty decent budget, um, and I get to. Oh, okay. So you do get a, a decent budget then from yeah. from the college or from the yeah for the to, pur to purchase wines for the class. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I always uh, wondered. I just never uh, formulated the question. No. Um. Yeah. Okay. We good have seeing you. Take care. Class. Same here. And we have um, Jackson shared his email address in the chapter. Okay, perfect. So I'll send you the, I'll send you those slides right away, Jackson. Well, and then uh, Victor, let's uh, let's start a new relationship here. I can't wait to share with you. I'm doing online basic cooking skills. Mm -hmm. Same idea. We uh, the students would come by. We give them a box of food for three weeks, and here are the recipes we're going to cover the next three weeks. They do a five seven slide PowerPoint, submit that to me. And then as we go into class, we're not actually cooking in class. We're talking about, okay, what did you burn? What mm -hmm. did you do correctly? Uh, show us pictures of your finished product. And I've got a specific rubric they follow, but it's working out terrific. I love it. So we'll share ideas down the road, okay? Sounds great, Jackson. I look forward to it. All right, Victor, thank you very much. Thanks for the entertainment this afternoon. It was All great. Right. Thanks. All right, man. Take care, everyone. Enjoy Take your care. weekend. Thank Bye. you so much, Victor. Bye. Thank you.